Hello everyone. Um, we just heard an excellent uh, ITC uh, colloquium by Jennifer Gaskins, um, who was telling us about the possible uh, electromagnetic signature of the dark matter. We may have seen it, but maybe not, and that has to be figured out. And Jennifer was very honest about the uncertainties, and we appreciate that. Um, and Jennifer will tell us a little more on, on the, uh, the dark matter later on. Uh, we will start with our own. In fact, today we have three uh, of our speakers from the CFA, and uh, I'm a little bit nervous about that because <laughs> our local speakers usually speak longer. Well, the outside people respect our rules. So, uh, let's see if it goes well today. Alexei Viklinin will uh, tell us about the successor to the Chandra X-ray Observatory, science drivers, technology status, and mission prospects. And that would be very important for the future years of the CFA. Um, and then we'll hear from Alisa Goodman, who will tell us about the skeleton of the Milky Way. Uh, where is Alisa? Oh, okay. uh, what about uh, the meat? There is no, you will not discuss uh, the meat of the Milky Way? Just the no, it's boring. Um, and then we'll hear from uh, Jennifer Gaskins again. Uh, and she will tell us about improved limits on sterile neutrino dark matter from full sky observations of the Fermi GBM. And finally, we'll hear from our own um, Yanfeng Yan Wu, and he will tell us about optical spectroscopy of X ray sources in the Galactic Bulge Survey. Alexei. Thank you very much. So, the purpose of this short presentation today is uh, to introduce the concept of uh, next generation X-ray observatory, which would be a true successor to Chandra. Uh, even if you haven't heard about this effort, it's, uh, been, uh, it's been proceeding in the observatory for a few years, and the concept was conceived uh, just in the aftermath of the low ranking of the International X-ray Observatory in the 2010 uh, U.S. Decadal Survey. And so uh, looking at uh, what we can do in the future, we thought that we should design uh, we should design an observatory which would be much more scientifically compelling than, uh, than IXO, but, um, but uh, at the same time more practical. Um, so uh, I obviously won't be able to go through this concept in detail today, and the purpose uh, is to give you a general idea for, for the mission we're trying to do and to get you sufficiently interested in science so that you will be uh, interested in, uh, in the science, uh, you will be supportive to the cause as it unfolds and accelerates in the, in the coming years. So uh, the new observatory uh, always means some new capabilities. So what is the main features of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, concept? First of all, it's massive gains in sensitivity. So it will be much more sensitive than Chandra. Uh, in fact, sensitivity will be sufficient to see very early stages of the supermassive black holes at redshift uh, of uh, 10 or even higher. Um, uh, it brings the high resolution spectroscopy capabilities at fine uh, one arc second spatial scales. Uh, so uh, you can do a lot of uh, uh, physical studies, uh, a lot of uh, astrophysics that are typically done by Chandra. You can bring it to the next level. Uh, and uh, you can do it with much higher statistical significance. In a sense, it's bringing another dimension to Chandra data. In addition to fine uh, spatial pictures, you bring spectroscopic capabilities along the line of sight. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, depending how you count, the factor between 200 and 1,000 gains in capability for the grating spectroscopy. So finally, it would make uh, real spectroscopic analysis a uh, mainstream tool for the, for the observatory. So we think uh, that this can be achieved essentially by using the overall envelope of the uh, Chandra mission. The concept we uh, developed for a number of years had a tentative name of SmartX. Uh, and so it is essentially uh, starts uh, with uh, Chandra spacecraft and we replace uh, two essential pieces of Chandra with uh, next generation uh, capabilities. First, the Chandra mirror system is replaced with a smartly built mirror system which has lower mass, same angle resolution, same focal length, but a factor of more, a factor of 30 more effective area. 
and a bigger field of view for imaging. I will talk about the mirror in the, in, in the next slide. Uh, I won't be able to talk about instruments today, but, uh, but the concept features next generation science instruments. Uh, uh, for example, a, a microcalorimeter with, uh, which can give you a fine spectroscopy on, uh, with one arc second pixels. A CMOS imager, which uh, can provide high sensitivity in the soft band and uh, high quality uh, camera to, that goes hand in hand with the mirror. And then insertable gratings with a lot of effective area and resolving power. What's nice about this overall concept is that it, it folds uh, a lot of past work uh, uh, into, into the uh, uh, next generation mission. For example, the, all the science instruments that we are discussing uh, is a general evolution uh, and of the technologies developed for IXO and in fact can be, can be, uh, can be realized with fairly gradual improvements of the IXO designs. Uh, most of the spacecraft requirements, such as mass, such as the total power, uh, the, the sizes, are very similar to Chandra. And so we think we, it can be built at a Chandra-like cost. So let's talk about the mirrors. Mirror is the heart and, uh, and, 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 and soul of the, of the new mission concept. Chandra mirrors, for those who don't know, are made of four nested shells, uh, which are uh, full shells made of uh, glass slabs which are one inch thick. So they weight uh, one and a half tons and they provide 0 0.08 square meters of collecting area. Uh, the new mirror, uh, which we consider, will, be, uh, will have a modular design. So it will be made of densely packed, thin segments mounted into modules, modules put in a big structure. This whole structure will weigh less than 900 kilos and provide 2.3 square meters of effective area, mostly because we, uh, we densely pack all the available input aperture with, uh, with uh, many, many, many nested shells. Uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, <laughs> bottleneck for realizing this design is the ability to build to build uh, those individual segments that go into modules to, with high enough quality. So there are several techniques on the play which, uh, which tell that you can produce those uh, segments, uh, just produce them with high enough quality, but we believe that uh, the observatory will greatly benefit from the uh, introducing the ability to adjust those thin shells either on the ground or in flight or both. So we are developing technology and that's a photo of the actual hardware which exists in our labs at the CFA of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of correcting this uh, segment, the shape of those segments with a thin piezo film and then a pattern of electrodes put on the piezo film and those uh, cells will also feature integrated electronics and strain gauges so that we can monitor the performance of the mirror system in flight and readjust if needed. Okay, so the overall optics design features massive performance gain. So it's a factor of 30 more effective areas than Chandra. If you combine, and, and it will be combined with big improvements in the low energy quantum efficiency uh, for the detectors. So it's a lot more effective area for the observatory. Uh, for example, a four megasecond Chandra deep field south can be done in just 80 kiloseconds. So uh, three months uh, in one day. Something like that. Uh, a factor of 10 larger solid angle for sub arc second images because of better optical design. So instead of 4x4 four four arc minute field of view where you have sub arc second resolution with Chandra, it will be 15 by 15 arc minutes. If you combine the sensitivity and, and effective area and, and solid angle, it's a factor of 500 higher grasp for surveys at faint X ray limits. So, for example, instead of doing just one cosmos field, this observatory can do 500 cosmos fields for the same exposure. Um, so, what do these gains in sensitivity uh, do for your science? So, I will go through uh, four uh, science examples just to provide you essentially teasers for the capabilities, and I would be our team would be very interested in talking to you and uh, and. Uh, and uh, developing more of this exciting science. One is, uh, one is the ability to observe um, uh, very early stages of the supermassive black hole growth. The problem, the, the problem we're addressing is really 
that uh, they observed uh, 1 billion solar mass black holes at redshift of 6. They barely have time to grow through accretion since the Big Bang. And so the general idea that there must be uh, an event which forms a seed for this uh, supermassive black hole after which uh, you, you put it on normal growth curve and, <laughs> and it just uh, uh, grows at about the Eddington rate for a sustained uh, period of time. So the range of masses for the seeds that people discuss, they, uh, they go in, uh, let's say, 10 to the 6 solar masses and below. So the sensitivity limits for uh, this observatory correspond to black hole masses uh, of uh, 30,000 uh, solar masses at redshift of 10 and uh, 100,000 solar masses at redshift of 15. So we would be able to see these black holes just after the jump on the normal on the normal, uh, on the normal um, uh, growth curve. And so uh, it's really, uh, it's... Essentially, I think you can, you, can, you can say that this observatory will have the ability to see the first accretion light in the universe due to supermassive black holes. So Webb will see the light in the first galaxies. Uh, this observatory will see the, the uh, accretion light from central black holes in these first galaxies. Uh, this is another example. A Sloan quasar at redshift of 6 uh, is sitting in an uh, environment which corresponds or resembles today's galaxy groups. This observatory in a reasonable exposure will be able to separate the quasar emission from the hot emission, from the, from the X-rays, from the hot gas surrounding, filling this halo and measure the parameters of the halo very well. So feed the spectrum, uh, determine spatial extent, and separate spatially the emission from the quasar from the emission of the hot gas surrounding the quasar. So it would be very nice to study um, is to study quasar environments at very high redshifts. That's at redshift of six. Okay, at redshift of one, this black hole goes into a nursing home, which is, which is, uh, you know, something a place like center of the Virgo cluster. In the Virgo cluster, from each square arc second, uh, we would be able to measure this type of spectra with tons of lines. So do uh, wonderful physics. Just a couple of slides on it. So, um, um, so. Uh, another topic is looking at galaxy formation. Uh, galaxy formation, of course, is, uh, uh, is a process that's mostly driven by, by feedback uh, in the central galaxies or, or essentially defined by the process of feedback in central galaxies. So on top, I have a couple of usual movies where, you know, galaxy of Milky Way size forms, and you can see that uh, gas with temperatures higher than 1 million degrees is, is, uh, is ubiquitous around those galaxies, and the structure of the gas is different depending on, 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 the, on the galaxy formation model. So the observatory will be able to see these halos to a redshift of about 1, uh, resolve those halos, determine the parameters, and uh, thus constrain the galaxy formation model. Essentially, complete the picture of galaxy formation in combination with this observation in the other wave bands. Uh, um, we can reach significantly higher, uh, significantly lower levels of the surface brightness, so, uh, and this would be sufficient to observe cosmic web in emission. So the simulation shows a volume 25 by 25 megaparsecs, uh, and it's a projected map of X-ray emission from this volume. So essentially, everywhere in the volume there is X-ray gas. Okay, Chandra is uh, is Chandra sensitivity. If you clip this picture at the Chandra sensitivity, you see that you can only observe the uh, the most massive and dense structures. Uh, if you if you go down factor of 30 or lower in the surface brightness you see the, start seeing the filaments connecting those, uh, connecting uh, the structures. And uh, so you essentially see the hydrogen. You can map hydrogen helium in emission with this observatory. And uh, this uh, suddenly brings into light a large fraction of local baryons and large fraction of volume. So you expand the discovery space immensely. And so I put uh, a name for observatory X-ray Sever. So what is it? So my final slide is the uh, political, uh, uh, political landscape for the observatory. So a couple of essential <coughs> developments has happened this, uh, this spring. NASA has announced plans to uh, 
to, to, to prepare for the 2020 U.S. decadals. So NASA will fund uh, several uh, large mission studies in the large category, uh, fund technology and, uh, and system level studies. Initial shortlist was presented by Paul Hertz, the director of NASA Astrophysics Division at the uh, last AWS mission. Uh, and X-ray severe, a concept uh, essentially identical to Smart X, is included in this short list of four. So now there's a phase of community discussions, and uh, finally in the fall of 2015, uh, NASA will select uh, uh, about the same number of missions for studies form the science definition and technology science and technology definition team and assign a NASA center to lead each study. So we hope to be, to remain one of the four that's being studied for the next decade. Um, so uh, we are teaming with Marshall Space Flight Center in, in going down this route and, and working on the concept. So Marshall is commu has committed center resources to do system level studies and initial cost estimate for the mission, real system level studies and initial cost estimate. Uh, um, we formed an interim and formal mission concept team that will uh, spearhead this process. Uh, we will produce a white paper and uh, other technical input for the community to, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, which, which will serve as an input for selection in the fall of, uh, of this year. Uh, and also Marshall will sponsor a broad-based science workshop later in the year with, where we can, we hope to uh, sharpen and broaden the science case for this next generation extra observatory. So uh, our interim objective is to generate technically credible and scientifically compelling concept, and our eventual goal is top ranking in the 2020 decadal. I would be very interested in talking to many of you about prospects for this. Thank you. No, it's uh, no. At this level, we no, we won't be confused. With with Chandra type resolution, we won't be confused. The, it uh, it uh, if you if you look at the confusion, at predicted confusion, the function of angular resolution, the critical transition point is around two arc seconds. At half an arc second, it's 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 fine down to uh, down to essentially as faint as you can. We have an overall. Uh, bound for the number counts, which is the total intensity of the X-ray background, so the log N log S cannot go, you know, very steep. And uh, before you hit this bound, uh, you know, uh, it, you, you can analyze those number counts with the constraint and show that confusion will not be a problem. So, in, in fact, this is our goal, and we've been generously supported by the observatory and also supported by NASA. Our goal is, uh, by the end of the year, to have a mirror pair uh, properly aligned, adjusted, and put an X-ray test at Marshall. Can you see it in one of the future? I hope so. I hope, I hope younger members of our team will make the presentation and showcase their good work. Okay, thank you. This and this is going to be super challenging. Okay. <clears throat> so the title of uh, today's short presentation is The Skeleton of the Milky Way. But before we can have a skeleton, uh, we need bones. So I'm going to tell you about this top paper first, and then I'll tell you what's going on with the skeleton, and I'm going to tell you why we have these funny names for things. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to point out the four people on this first paper that came out just the end of last year who are from the CFA. Chris Beaumont's not here anymore, but importantly, uh, Tom Dame has been really instrumental in this work, and Mark was so generous to help us and didn't even want to join the paper, but we have to thank Mark um, as well. So 
the hint there is I'm going to tell you about some very long, skinny infrared dark clouds that turn out to be very important in the structure of the galaxy. So one of them is called Nessie, and that's why the first statement you should remember is that Nessie is a bone of the galaxy. The second paper, and I did not name it Nessie, by the way. Um, the second paper is by uh, Catherine Zucker, Kara Battersby, and me. And I'll introduce Kara in a little while. Where's Kara? There she is. She's an SMA postdoc. She'll come up again in the story. Kara Battersby, by the way, is a fantastic uh, REU student who we had last year who we just admitted to this department. So after this, my main goal is to convince you that when she comes to visit, please make her choose Harvard for graduate school. Catherine's the R.U. student. Did I say Kara? Oh, sorry. Kara's the postdoc. <laughs> sorry. So uh, Kara's uh, work with Catherine, uh, following up on, on this bones thing, lets you see that you can actually map out a skeleton of the Milky Way from bones. I understand that if you haven't read either of these papers, this makes no sense. So let me explain all of this by taking you to Bavaria. Um, so some of you have been to this fine castle in Bavaria owned by our friends at the Max Planck Society, and you know that they have conferences there on a particular small topic, and they lock you up with 60 other people for a week and feed you German food and lots of beer, and you're supposed to come up with great ideas. Um, and this particular conference was about the early phases of star formation, but you'll notice that this talk is not about the early phases of star formation. So what happened is someone showed this beautiful Spitzer image, thank you, Giovanni, um, in this orientation, and there was this big long cloud on it, which happens to be called Nessie, and they were talking about these little red blobs, which are the early stars forming in this cloud. And <clears throat> some of us were tired of talking about the early phases of star formation, and uh, one person in particular, Andy Burkert, shouted out from the back of the room, is Nessie parallel to the galactic plane? Because being a good theorist, he thought, how could you have something, this was already known to be 80 parsecs long and less than a parsec wide, how could you have something that long last for any amount of time unless it had something to do with the, the structure of the galaxy? But in fact, because this was a very narrowly focused meeting on star formation, no one had any idea whether this was parallel to the galactic plane because, of course, there were no coordinates. Um, turns, out, <laughs> turns out we have this wonderful program called Worldwide Telescope, which some of us who I can't remember whose talk it was. It's good, because I was very bored with the talk. So in the back of the room, I um, started playing with Worldwide Telescope. And if you change it from celestial north being up to galactic coordinates, in fact, it turns out, yes, this is remarkable. Um, Nessie is parallel to the galactic plane. And this part was known as Nessie. But in fact, Nessie is hugely long, goes on and on. But bizarrely, OK, it's not at the equator. So here's zero of galactic latitude. Now, for anybody who hasn't read this paper, does anybody immediately know why? Ah, good. OK, I don't feel as stupid as we did because it took us a few days to actually figure out why. OK, the answer is Mark knows. So he, he knew before I even did this. But people like Mark know that the sun is not in the plane of the galaxy. And it turns out Adrian Blau knew that the sun was not in the plane of the galaxy, too, and he just didn't want to admit it. Okay, so Mark has moved the galactic center out of the IAU galactic plane, and the sun is 20 or 25 parsecs off the plane of the galaxy. So this means that there's a tilt between the, the zero, the flat galactic plane that the IAU coordinate system defines, and the actual plane of the galaxy, if the galaxy is, in fact, a flat plane. Okay? And so if you take into account the height of the sun and the offset of the galactic center, it turns out that there's a little bit of a shift between where you would expect the galactic plane to be at zero and where it actually is. And that depends on distance because, you know, as you go uh, farther away, the angular difference gets, I mean, the angular difference is the same and the linear distance gets smaller. But this is really funny. I just have to read this to you. So here's a quote from the 1959 definition of galactic coordinates. It says, the equatorial plane of the new coordinate system, meaning the galactic coordinate system, must of necessity pass through the sun. It is a fortunate circumstance that within the observational uncertainty, both the sun and Sagittarius A lie, meaning the galactic center, uh, lie in the mean plane of the galaxy as determined from the hydrogen observations, the new H1 observations at that time. If the sun had not been so placed, points in the mean plane would not lie on the galactic equator. Okay, so it turns out that Blau wrote another paper in 1959 that actually showed that that this was probably a problem and that the sun was not in the galactic plane, but the error bars were big enough that he just said, let's, let's leave it all at zero. It's easier that way. Okay? 
But it turns out that this is actually good news, because if you think about it, if the galaxy is really, really flat, okay, and then there are super high contrast features painted. So take a Sharpie and write on a completely flat white galaxy, okay, really high contrast features. Then if you're a little tiny bit above this totally flat plane, you get a perspective. You get a very foreshortened view, but a top-down view of the galaxy, right? So you're not really completely in the plane of the galaxy, and you have some chance of seeing the Milky Way structure from within the Milky Way. Okay, so it turns out this is really good news. So this line here, this dot, so the black dashed line, these are just whether or not you account for the offset of the galactic center. These two things, you can see they're almost the same. It doesn't really matter, so just look at whichever one you like. The black dashed line is zero of the galactic coordinate system. The dotted colored line is when you account for these offsets where the true center, where the galactic plane actually is at the distance of the Scutum Centaurus arm, which is at 3.1 kiloparsecs. These other colored lines, I'll explain the colors in a second, but these other colored lines are plus and minus 20 parsecs at 3.1 kiloparsecs. Okay, so this thing is extremely close to the galactic plane, and like I said, it's less than a parsec thick, and if I could zoom in on these images for you, you'll see that it's very, very tenuous and, and uh, a bunch of little connected pieces. The colors are the predicted velocity for galactic rotation. And we have all kinds of wonderful velocity information. We don't have masers. This, I should say that this work connects nicely to the Bessel uh, survey that Mark is leading and also to the CO work that Tom Dame is uh, famous for, and Tom is involved in this work. And so from CO, but also importantly from dense gas tracers, we have measurements along points along these clouds, very accurate measurements of the velocity. So this is the predicted velocity for that arm. And then if you superimpose point measurements of dense gas, the color now matches this velocity scale. And you can see that all of the ones that are along this Nessie region, the color of the dot matches the color of the line. If it has a white circle, it's a very close match. A gray circle is a not so great, but pretty good match. And the other colors are, of course, completely off. And so if you zoom in, it's, it's kind of crazy how well the velocity of this thing matches. So essentially what you're saying is that on the sky, it's where it belongs, and in velocity space along the line of sight, it's also where it belongs. I could tell you more about how we know the velocities if I have time at the end, but I want to get to the story of the full skeleton. Okay, so this is an image of a real galaxy. I know there's a lot of theorists here, so this is a simulation. Okay, this is a real galaxy. Okay, so this is an infrared image of a real galaxy, uh, IC342. And you notice that it has spiral-like features, but then it has all this webby stuff in between. And so, yes, the velocities really do suggest that Nessie itself is an arm, but it's possible that some of these other kind of interconnecting features, which Evo Stryker and other people have found to be systematic, kind of like in this simulation in some cases, and called spurs, but basically there's all kinds of very long skinny things potentially in, in galaxies that you could see in this way. The problem is if you look over here at this simulation, which was the state of the art a, a little more than a year ago from Claire Dobbs, this is nice. Sure, there's lots of long skinny things. There are arms. But take a look at this edge-on view to get an idea of the scale, right? This is plus one to minus one kiloparsec. I told you that this feature is less than a parsec thick, okay? So this kind of image is not going to do anything to tell us what are these features, what caused them, where would we expect them to be, et cetera. But lucky us, uh, while our paper was in the refereeing process, uh, Rowan Smith and colleagues in Heidelberg used a repo um, to make a higher resolution adaptive mesh based, uh, well, a repo based uh, simulation. And if you zo zoom in on a little piece of this simulation of a Milky Way like galaxy, you start to see these long, skinny features with almost the right scale, you know, close enough, high enough resolution. There's a 100 parsec scale bar. So these things are just a couple of parsecs across. And if you look at the edge-on view of that same simulation, it's kind of amazing. Here are plus and minus 20 parsec lines again, and here is all this filamentary structure um, in the plane of the galaxy. Okay, so I will get to the punchline, Avi. And the punchline is, here's wonderful Kara, who's right there, Catherine, who I mentioned earlier. And um, we had the opportunity to put together everything we know last summer and say, okay, well, we can project onto the plane of, oops, sorry, which is kind of important, sorry. Uh, we can project onto uh, images of the galaxy uh, traces of the spiral arm, assuming that we know the height of the sun. 
and the distance of the arms. And so these dashed lines, and I won't show you this whole thing, I'll just skip through it, um, but these dashed lines show you where on the sky you would expect to find these kind of features. And so what Kara and Catherine did, mostly Catherine in this phase, was to look through all of those things and find candidates of these long skinny clouds other than Nessie uh, that would be in the right place in projection on the sky. But then of course the question is what their velocity is and we had a lot of other dense gas uh, velocity measurements at our disposal and this slide which I'll skip but you should ask me about the glue software some other time um, in order for me to tell you how we did this but we can basically figure out where the clouds go in 3D and this is kind of the money plot, this is the end. Um, this is a position velocity diagram now of the whole galaxy in CO, and these little dots, these little clusters of dots, here's Nessie, show you in position velocity space where these candidate clouds are. Um, ultimately, about six out of 10 of them fit all the criteria we set up. They're more than an aspect ratio of 50 to one. They're within a certain number, of, small number of kilometers a second of galactic rotation. These uh, lines that are traced on here are various models for where the spiral arms are. It's kind of eerie, actually, how well some of these clouds fit, um, uh, and some of them don't. So in fact, we'll probably wind up refining where the spiral arms are if we can prove that these things really are uh, comprising the skeleton of the Milky Way. Uh, Catherine is an excellent author, and she just finished a complete uh, draft of the new paper, and you can see it there. Thank you very much. Well, exactly. So in other words, we, we, it has to go back and forth between the simulations and the galaxy because this is essentially the only way that we can do this. In other words, observationally, uh, to have this kind of resolution kind of anywhere in the galaxy, you have to have something that's everywhere. So masers are great, but they're not everywhere. Um, and CO is great, but it's low resolution. So observationally, the problem is all we can do is say, can we see these things or not? And the problem is that the easiest way to identify them is as shadows, but you need a bright background. You need to essentially be lucky. Okay, so it's a little bit random whether or not you can see these things. So it's a little bit hard to say what the observational selection bias is. So if you knew you could see all of them, then you could say things about, you know, how wavy the galaxy is, in fact, if you can see distant ones, but it's a little hard. So what we need is a simulation that's a little bit more realistic than that one, where we can then observe it from being essentially at the position of the sun and figure out how wavy do you have to be, how many clouds in the way do you have to put to see a certain number of these. Oh. Probably, but there I would defer to Mark and say that I think that the maser measurements are going to, you know, if that's, if you're worried about that sort of global um, tilt, I, what do you think, Mark? And um, Bob Benjamin, who's on this project, was pointing out that there are these observations of H1 that say that there are sort of 50 parsec scale ripples. But what's weird is that at least in this very dense material, apparently, the, the ripples must be much less for us to be able to see this many. Okay. Uh, how much extinction is bound to the um, In uh, the equivalent, in visual extinction is hundreds of magnitudes. Yeah. And how much mass is in uh, it's about 10,000 to 100,000. It's not very big. They're, you know, they're very uh, uh, wispy. So in other words, you, you, can, you can sort of see a trace of these things, but they're not more than a few hundred thousand solar masses, you know, even if you sort of most optimistically give them a little envelope that you can't see. Yeah, and it's also, I didn't show it, but we also have Herschel images now, so you can also see it in emission. Um, but what we don't have, and what we have proposed to Iram to do, Kara has written a nice proposal, and someday it will get uh, accepted, um, is to look at the density profile in dense gas in a totally fully mapped and resolved way across the thing. So in other words, we don't know what their radial profile is very well.
Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about in the next 10 minutes is essentially a story about using a data set in an un unanticipated way and getting some interesting results out of it. So what, the, what we did is we actually derived new constraints on sterile neutrino dark matter using the Fermi gamma ray burst monitor, which if you're familiar with the GBM, um, it's an instrument for detecting gamma ray bursts that's not typically used to do other sort of uh, data analysis. This is work I'm doing with uh, a grad student at Ohio State University, which is uh, Kenny Ng, and these other collaborators that I've listed down here. So the, the one slide background on this, which you've probably heard because we have some experts on this particular uh, scenario uh, in the audience, I think, uh, is that you can detect sterile neutrino dark matter indirectly uh, if you exploit the fact that they can radi radiatively decay to active neutrinos. Uh, that would produce a photon line signal at half of the sterile neutrino mass. So and there's some Barton diagrams that show how that happens. Uh, this means that X-ray telescopes can then search for spectral lines coming from KEV mass neutrinos. Um, and so what's shown in this plot here, uh, there's actually, I guess that's soft gamma rays, there's integral, there's um, uh, this thing marked Milky Way here, Ursa Minor. These are basically um, constraints that have been placed in this particular parameter space based on the non-observation of photon line signals in the appropriate energy range. So the y-axis here is actually the sterile neutrino mass, so they're looking for a line signal at half the mass. The x-axis is essentially the, uh, the mixing angle with active neutrinos. This sets the amplitude of the flux. So this is actually 90 degrees probably to the way you're used to thinking of similar constraint plots where you have an energy or a mass on this axis and you have a, a normalization on the y-axis. So these other constraints that are listed here, I, so the, 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 the three on the sort of top right corner, these are all not model dependent. These are based, these are specifically constraining the flux of the sterile neutrinos, uh, of the lines from sterile neutrinos. And then uh, these other two constraints I've listed here are actually model dependent. Uh, they come from uh, uh, Lyman alpha measurements, which probe clustering in the early universe, and also from the dark matter abundance. But these depend on the production mechanism in your particular model for sterile neutrinos. Um, so you'll notice that there's a nice little window of parameter space that remains here. And uh, so what we identified is that uh, simply based on the energy range of the Fermi's GBM, um, in principle, GBM might have data to probe down to this particular energy. So we could potentially probe a large fraction of this window here. So let me briefly tell you about the Fermi gamma ray burst monitor. Um, uh, so you might recognize that overall this, this big image here is Fermi, um, and the top essentially is a large area telescope, or LAT, which is the primary instrument. Uh, the GBM is a whole bunch of detectors that are essentially stuck on the side. Um, there's 12 sodium iodide detectors that are the ones of interest for us, uh, given their energy range. The lower energy range is 8 keV, but the effective area is really falling off at that very low energy. Um, there's also two bismuth germinate detectors, um, which are slightly higher energy. And the important thing is that the GBM is observing the entire unocculted sky at all times. They're essentially stuck all around the instrument. Um, it means that it gathers an enormous number of statistics. This is not a statistics limited analysis here. Um, just so you see which ones we're talking about, so this is two different projections of where the detectors are. Uh, conveniently, there are two detectors that point very close to the lat pointing direction, which means they get similar sky coverage to the lat. However, there's some issues with the spacecraft blocking part of their view, which you can see in the effective area plots. Um, so for that reason, we didn't choose those. We chose another detector that also points fairly close to the lat pointing direction, but it has less problems with spacecraft blockage. So we're using detector 7. We don't need to use more than one detector, quite frankly, because we have way more statistics than we can handle, and we're systematics limited, not statistics limited. Um, this shows the uh, effective area, um, both as a function of angle and as a function of energy. So in terms of the effective area, you'll notice that it angles greater than about 40 degrees from the center of the field of view. There's a few points where it sort of drops off, and that's due to spacecraft blockage. Um, this is a fairly clean detector in terms of, of that uh, issue, though. Uh, one important thing is that the effective area is defining the field of view that's relevant for these detectors. There's no photon tracking capability. They're basically just a detector that collects everything that comes in and counts it, which means that um, the effective area essentially, I mean, you're, you're basically getting photons from, from almost half the sky at any given, uh, in any given pointing direction. So you have no really good way of knowing where the photons came from. You just know that you can collect a whole lot of them. Um, in terms of effective areas, a function of energy, it really increases a lot as you go to higher energies, but the stuff we're most interested in based on the window is going to be down here. This is our predicted, uh, prediction for the dark matter decay signal. Um, I'm showing J, which is basically a normalization that depends on the distribution of dark matter. It's proportional to the intensity that you would observe. So this is intensity as a function of angle. 
Um, and I've marked here the effective field of view of the GBM detector. So the top is essentially the differential uh, intensity. Um, this is the intensity integrated over the solid angle out to here. So um, what, what this is showing, these four different curves are different density profiles, but the important thing is that because we're integrating over such a large region, it doesn't really matter the fine details of the inner density profile. So the main issue here is because we don't have this photon tracking capability, we can't correctly calculate a flux within a narrow uh, field of view or a narrow region of interest. Um, uh, so we can't exactly calculate, for example, a flux. So what we did then is we created a suite of tools to do directional analysis of the GBM data. So in particular, the, the, the observable we're going to compare with that we can calculate is the count rate in a specified detector as a function of galactic pointing direction. And we use the actual pointing and lifetime history of the lat. No, this is not a flux. I cannot calculate a flux. I'm always going to calculate a count rate in a particular direction. Uh, we also made a simulation tool so that we can basically simulate our dark matter models and compare that to the data. Um, okay. So, so just to show you how this works, this is an actual flux map of the X-ray sky as seen by Rosat. Uh, this is one and a half keV. This is the closest I could find to match what I'm about to show you. This is what the X-ray sky looks like as seen by GBM. Now, this is not a flux map. Keep in mind, this is count rate in a particular pointing direction, and this is around 10 keV. So this is the data set after we've excluded uh, basically time intervals that are not uh, producing quality data for us. There's a little spot there where we actually have no data, and that has to do with the. Uh, the, the orbit of the, and the pointing of the lat and whether or not we actually got data on that part of the sky from this detector. So if I flip back and forth, you'll see more or less, if you imagine smoothing this to about 60 degrees, we kind of see what we'd expect. <laughs> um, so another thing I want to point out is this issue of instrumental backgrounds. So we applied a lot of cuts to the data to try to reduce these instrumental backgrounds. And at low energies, it does seem that we are astrophysical, sort, or astrophysical emission dominated. However, as you go to higher energies, you'll see the sky really isotropizes. And that's showing you that essentially most of the photons that you're collecting are actually coming from instrumental backgrounds. Uh, this is the simulated dark matter signal. Um, again, it's, it's smoothed out to 60 degrees. Uh, so we did two different analyses. One is a simple flux analysis, and this is just showing an example. So we, all we do is we require that the dark matter signal does not exceed the total count rate that's measured in the energy bin of the particular line that we're investigating. Uh, within the selected ROI, we're using 60 degrees around the galactic center because that's essentially the effective area of our instrument. This gives us very robust and conservative limits, probably not the most interesting, but at least you can believe it. The next thing we do is we do a spectral analysis. This is fairly simple. We just choose a window around each line energy, uh, larger than the observed line signal width. We assume within that energy window that we can model the data as a power law plus a line. Um, and then the, the only model parameters then are the signal and background normalizations and the uh, power law uh, index for the background. This is showing an example of the counts as a function of energy. You'll realize this looks nothing like a line or a power law. And remember, because this is not flux, this is counts. Um, there's also the issue that the GBM energy bins are actually not exactly log space. You get some really funny features that, that are happening <laughs> because of that. So um, the background only fit uh, is shown in blue. It's the, the blue curve. Um, and this is to the actual data, which is the blue uh, uh, points. This is actually a power law if you put it out into, uh, in flux, but um, it, in this particular projection, it doesn't look like a power law. And then where the, the red uh, arrow is, is marking where we put a putative line. And then it's the fit if you have the background plus the 95% upper level, uh, upper limit uh, on the signal. So this is essentially how we did those two analyses. These are our results. These are the new constraints. So I've now actually turned this over to the more familiar uh, direction. So this is the mixing angle here on the y-axis and the dark matter mass on the x-axis. Um, this is the constraints that you get from non-observation of lines in these regions. Um, the dashed black line here is what you get simply from the flux limit, so it's the most conservative and robust uh, constraint. And then from the spectral analysis, we get this result here. So we actually cut into a large fraction of that remaining window with this analysis. Um, so I also want to comment that I think this is actually a fairly uh, conservative approach. One of the things we had to deal with was the systematic uncertainty, and we're using, using a fairly large assumed systematic uncertainty uh, on the effective area of GBM to make sure that we really believe this limit here, and to deal with the fact that um, we're, use, we're doing essentially a, a somewhat non-standard analysis with this data set. So to conclude, we've made new tools to use the angular information in the GBM data and we applied them in the context of this sterile neutrino line search, and we placed a new constraint on the parameter space, closing a large fraction of the remaining window. Thank you.
No, I can't. I, I was actually going to mention at the beginning. You'll notice that due to the um, the energy, well, the, I think it was in the first slide. The energy reach of GBM, the lower energy is eight keV, and uh, and thus we're the, the stuff of interest for the line is um, yeah. So basically, the stuff of interest for the line is actually going to be slightly down here. So actually, I'm curious if anyone has any comments about constraints from Lyman alpha on that particular scenario, but um, yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry, no, this is, yeah, so it should be on there, it'd be 7 keV. So no, GBM just doesn't have that ability. <laughs> okay, Thank you Hello. <clears throat> okay. Um, my name is uh, oh, sorry, Jian Feng Wu. I'm a postdoc at High Energy Division at CFA. Uh, today I'm going to talk about one of my recent publications, uh, <clears throat> giving a brief overview of the Galactic Bulb Survey and especially on the optical spectroscopic part of the project. And uh, the Galactic Bulb Survey is a, a large international collaboration, and the PI of the project, Dr. Peter Yonker, is affiliate, affiliated with CFA. Okay, so what is uh, GBS? So GBS is a survey of the X resources in the galactic uh, bulge. It's a multivalent survey. So the first step is we uh, have a shallow chamber survey with two kilosecond per pointings on two six uh, degree by one degree strips here shown here, uh, one uh, one degree above and below the galactic center. And this region is uh, partly overlapped with uh, Josh, Josh's uh, uh, galactic latitude survey. <clears throat> and we chose this region is, is because uh, we can uh, uh, avoid the overcrowding and significant extinction problem uh, in the galactic center still, while still maintaining a high uh, number density of sources. So in total, we detected 1,640 X-ray sources shown here. And uh, the circle size represents the count, the X-ray counts. And because the uh, south crowding and extinction problem is less severe in our region, so we can do extensive multivalence follow-up on these sources, especially in the optical and the infrared band. So the science goal of the GBS, <coughs> we have uh, two science goals of GBS. One is to identify the uh, quiescent low-mass X-ray binaries to measure the uh, mass for the black holes and neutron stars. For neutron stars, uh, we can study the equation of state. And for black holes, so there is a, a mass gap in the black hole mass distribution, uh, which means that there, uh, there is no known black holes with three to five solar mass, uh, which th this mass gap may be uh, caused by the uh, bias in previous black hole binary ident identifications throughout the actual outburst. So we are trying to find the first black hole binary in quiescence uh, without uh, having uh, gone through a recent outburst and to see whether these kind of black holes can fill in the mass gap. Uh, the second uh, science goal is to constrain in the common envelope evolution of binaries via the uh, number counting for different types of binaries, like CVs versus uh, low mass X binaries. So both of the science goals relies on the uh, optical spectroscopic uh, classification for the X resources. So we, have, we first took surveys on, on these large samples of, of detected X resources and for in, uh, individual interesting objects, we, uh, we are uh, obtaining the higher quality uh, spectrum with these uh, instruments. So, so there are some previous works uh, identified some uh, pro, uh, uh, creating binaries. Uh, this paper have the uh, spectra for five sources 
And some of them, like this one, this one, this one, are the uh, polar or intermediate polars. And this source is, is a Dwarf Nova based on its uh, light curve. And this one is a, a candidate low mass uh, X-ray binary based on this broad and uh, double peaked uh, HR5 emission. And for this paper, uh, Torres set out is on, on a large, uh, larger data set. And we developed a formal criterion for equivalent binaries, which means the strong HR5 emission line, like shown here. This source is with strong uh, HR5 emission line. And if the uh, uh, the HRFI is not strong enough, and then we are looking for the uh, detection of helium lines like this one here, here. And we identified another 22 new accreting binaries. And for my work here is a general, uh, is a Gemini uh, GMO spectroscopy survey on 21 GPS sources. And here are the, all the spectrum for these sources. And some of them, like shown in this column, have uh, the uh, HRF emission is what we are looking for. And uh, so for some sources, like this one, uh, we zoom here, has a very broad HRF emission. And uh, the, uh, there are some uh, variability of the HRF emission between epochs. And the uh, next one for this one, you see the double peaked profile of HRF emission during different epoch spectroscopy. And for some other sources, like this one, the HRV emission is really narrow, and plus we, we see the molecular uh, feature here, so it's uh, uh, likely the active stars or binaries. Like this one, uh, we, we see the uh, periodic uh, variability. And for other sources here, they don't have HRV emission. Some of them have, have, have strong HRV absorption, which may be just like uh, from an ordinary star, and some of others have no none features at all at HRF uh, position, and it turns out these sources may be more interesting. So for these sources, we first did the spectral classification, which uh, like uh, finding the best match uh, stellar spectral template for these X-ray X -ray sources, and then we subtract the the standard template. And to, to look at the, what the residual spectrum looks like. So for some sources here, the residual has basically nothing, which means the, 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 the spectrum of this actual source is, just, is, is basically uh, can, be, can be fully explained by an by a, a ordinary star spectrum. But for some others, we can see the, uh, there, are, there is HRF emission in the residual spectrum. We show two examples here. One is this one, zoom in. This is the uh, Gemini spectrum for the X-ray source, and this is the star template, and this is the residual. You can see a broad HRF emission here with the width of 1,400 kilometers per second. Another example, this one, zooming here, still the <clears throat> from the residual, see a broad HRF emission of 6,600 uh, kilometers per second. So for these sources, may indicate there is a population of hidden accreting binaries that uh, hasn't been identified before. F for these sources, uh, you don't see the HRF emission uh, uh, in, in, in their spectrum, but after removing the contribution from the presumed uh, companion star from the residual spectrum, you can, you can see the HRF emission. The broad HRF emission is likely originated from the accretion disk. And certainly, there is, uh, there is uncertainty associated with our uh, spectral classification. Maybe we are not finding the best uh, match template. So to test the robustness of, of our result, uh, we tried different uh, spectral templates, like this one, this example. Uh, this, this GNI spectral uh, is the best fit template, and this is the residual. And we tried other uh, spectral types bracketing this GNI. And uh, the, the HRF emission, uh, arises in all the cases. And for this example, it's true that the, the HRF emission line is kind of narrow, so we are uh, not, be, uh, not able to tell whether it's a uh, accreting binary or it's an active star or binary, but we, we may <coughs> need have the help of from other data. Like for this one, the from light curve, we can see the signature of ellipsoidal modulation, so it's a, it, it, it could be 
uh, a promising candidate of, uh, of the hidden or creating binary. And we are obtaining the <coughs> better spectrum for, for this object. And this one, uh, for this one, is a, a, very a very interesting feature is the significant HR variability. So these two spectrum are both for the same source. And this one is uh, obtained by the VLTV mode. So you see a, a, a broad HRF emission line here. And this one is the Gemini spectrum obtained one year later. And there is no HRF emission. However, as I showed just now, actually this example, after you subtract the best uh, fit standard template in the residual spectrum, you can see the HRF emission. And, and compare this, this HR5 uh, line and this HR5 line, you can see the, the, the strength of the HR5 decreased by a factor of more than two. So here's the summary. Uh, the Galactic Bulge Survey is a multi-wavelength campaign uh, aiming to identify quiescent uh, low mass X binaries. And uh, we have found promising candidates based on the parent's broad HR5 emission profile and more interestingly, we, have, we may have reviewed a population of hidden accreting binaries. For these sources, there is no appar uh, apparent uh, accretion uh, signature. However, uh, the, the broad HRF emission arises after the spectral decomposition. So for the next steps, um, I I'm now working on a much larger sample of 400 GBS sources with a VLT VMOS spectra to aim to find more this uh, prominent candidate with apparent uh, HRV emission and also to confirm the, the existence of this population of hidden accreting binaries. And eventually we will finish the special classification for all the 1600 GBS sources. Thank you very much. Could you, can you go back one slide and show us that subtraction again? This one? Yeah. You mean this one? Yeah. So this this one, this one is the interstellar band at, at 6280 Angstrom. So yes. So if you look at the residuals, they have bits, uh, and from there, can you interpret uh, what kind of binary parameters you have? Uh, yes, like like the exam here, I show two. Ex to, uh, these two examples because uh, their residual HR for emission are very broad. So they could be, I mean, likely originated uh, from a human disk. And for these one, they are narrow with less than 200 kilometers per second. So they could be active uh, star or binaries. So we need more, like, like, like the, uh, this example here, we need more uh, other information to, to uh, investigate the nature of these uh, sources, like light curve or other things. Um, yes, yes, it could be. Um, but, but those are mainly CVs, so magnetic, magnetic CVs. And uh, so for we are searching for H alpha emission. Actually, our ultimate goal is to find the low mass extra binaries. So we are more concerned about H alpha emission. And certainly, the CVs can also have H alpha emission. So for, for those uh, for things, we, we are more uh, really interesting or more promising we, we are we need we need higher quality uh, spectrum to define that oh yes 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 Uh, yes, actually, um, actually, we, we did a kind of like uh, estimation of the population for all these 1,600 
sources, and there could be a significant uh, portion, like maybe 30%, I think, could be active stars and others uh, could be CVs and low-mass exterminators. The thing is, so first, for, uh, for, for the 1,600 sources, uh, for the majority of them, I, I would say like 80%, over 80%, they only have three X-ray cons, barely the, the, the X-ray detection limit. And the second thing is, we actually don't know the distance of these sources yet. And many of them could be foreground uh, sources. Yeah, and, and uh, so for, for, for those who have, have the uh, spectra, like we can kind of estimate the, the, the distance based on the uh, interstellar absorption band, like uh, just, I just showed uh, for, uh, on, on the other slide. Yes. Thank you.